All right, welcome everybody to Pro 150 um, or Section 150 of a mod about communications and a mod on communications, excuse me. And this will be a great opportunity, I think, for all of us to try to improve our communication skills. Uh, some of you may be asking why a communications class. If you are asking that, uh, hopefully after tonight you'll feel like they're that I'm able to give you some answers on why a communications class could be so important and so helpful as you continue your education, but also, and perhaps more importantly, as you proceed with your career, right? And as you try to find the next career potentially or the upgrade that you're looking for, the promotion that you're looking for within work for some of you. So tonight we'll introduce what it is that we're gonna be talking about in the course a little bit more in detail. We'll talk about the expectations that I have for the course, uh, how I grade, what I'm looking for. And once we complete that, then we'll go over the material. Uh, I'll always be careful to make sure and review any coursework that's assigned this week. And throughout this course, we just have discussion board uh, assignments each week, right? So this week, we'll spend a few minutes talking about what's required of you on the assignment and give you some examples on how you could accomplish the assignment. I'll give you a heads up right now, the assignment should not be stressful, should not be hard. There's a template that you can use, it makes it very simple, straightforward. And then if you give some feedback as, as the uh, discussion asks or requests this week, you'll be in great shape, probably get full credit as long as you follow instructions and, and give me some feedback. But we'll talk more in detail and actually show you a little bit, demonstrate a little bit of how you can do that assignment and I keep referring to it as assignment, but uh, whenever I say that, you can assume that we're just talking about our discussion boards each week, right? Because there are no assignments or assessments in this particular course. Now, John, just for my reference, how many uh, online classes have you taken before? Is this one of your first ones, or is this one of your last ones? Are you in the beginning or the end of, of your degree? Okay, so you're a few mods in. So I don't know if you've had other mods where you've had a test each week and an assignment each week. But like I say, this is a little bit of a break from that where we're going to focus in on discussion boards, but we won't have a traditional assignment or a traditional assessment or test each week. So that should be welcome. That should be uh, good news for many of you. Uh, this course could be very straightforward, very um, straightforward as far as the expectations and, and what you need to do to pass it. However, uh, because it's so straightforward and so simple in a way, so straightforward in a way, many people, you know, do what we all do and procrastinate a little bit, sometimes fall behind. And then if you're like me, if we procrastinate till the end, something with family or work or our health comes up, if it can happen, it will, right? Uh, and it'll keep us from being able to get our assignments in and complete the course. So just stay consistent, stay up to date, and you'll be in great shape. Yeah, a lot more is writing on each one of these discussion boards, right, than, than most classes where you kind of split up those points among a lot more uh, a lot more work, a lot more coursework. So you're on to something there. I, I hopefully I've hopefully I've given you a little bit of fair warning both on the discussion board and on the announcement board, because I just don't want anybody to overlook these discussions each week and maybe treat them how they do in other classes and kind of be a little bit too lax about them. Um, each week is over 20% of your grade, right? So be very careful that you follow the instructions, read all the instructions, read all the assignments, and make sure, just as a, as a follow-up to this, that when you're doing the discussion boards, that you not only read all the instructions, but one of the things that can really help your score each week or at least uh, assure that you'll get most or all of the points is if you read through the reading material, right? And if you read through the reading material and then demonstrate within the discussion board that you've read it by talking, you know, about those articles or bringing those articles up within your discussion board comments, which actually for this week will be fairly challenging as we only have about 100 words, right? At least 100 words that we can put on. We can always put more than that. But 100 words goes really fast, right? So be careful that you don't just state your opinion about the different forms of communication on this week's assignment that you put within your Excel sheet 
you've already got a hundred hundred words, so you just you just move on and you don't demonstrate um, that you've read the material because part of the instructions and the assignment for each week on the discussion board is to read some online articles and review some online articles about communication. Okay, so just a, a quick tip on that. All right, so before we get to a little bit more detail, a little bit more foundation work on communication, the importance of the topic, I wanted to talk a little bit about expectations for the course. This should be all a review. We don't have to cover as many different aspects because this course is a little more simplified and streamlined where it's only got the discussion board and the checkpoints. Please don't overlook the checkpoints, right? Uh, you may or may not know this or have been told this many times before in courses, but the checkpoints represent about 20% of your grade and about a half a letter grade of extra credit is is potentially there for you if you'll participate every day on the discussion on the on the checkpoints. So please, please, please stay consistent on the checkpoints. Have a consistent time each day that you go in and take care of that so that you can get those points both for your grade but also to create a buffer for extra credit as well. A lot of people will get to the end of a course like this and ask me for extra credit opportunities and many times I'll say, you know, I, I, I can't give extra credit opportunities if I don't see that there's some effort put into the discussion, or excuse me, the checkpoints, which are the easiest way to get those points. Well, I'll check that, Jonah. Sometimes these, these, uh, these are questions that the school has come up with and sometimes they're really tricky or confusing. So it's one thing to be tricky or confusing, but it's another thing to, you know, sometimes there's just mistakes in those questions. So if you ever feel like there might be a mistake and don't hesitate to email me and communicate with me about that, you know, potential problem because uh, periodically we'll come across a question that the school put together that's just not right. Okay. So I don't know if that's the case today, but just keep that in mind going forward that if you have legitimate concerns or, or problems with how the question was asked or what the answers were, I'm happy to discuss that with you. It's not going to count against you, you know, to bring that up to me. Um, but if it's just you missed something, don't don't worry about it. We, we'll, you know, chalk it up to one of your extra credit problems, right? Yeah, no worries on that one. We all have that happen, right? And so that's why those extra credit questions uh, come in handy, right, to help us out and, uh, you know, give us a few extra points. All right, so a couple things we've talked about. We've talked a little bit about course expectations. Let me just say this. We, we've talked about how important the discussion boards are going to be each week. We talked about how I strongly encourage you to stay really caught up on the checkpoints. The discussion boards, I'll just say, um, can be turned in late. They can be completed late, but so it's so important that we have a class discussion on the discussion boards that I have to penalize you and I have to penalize you more points than normal for being late. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't still complete the discussion boards if you are late or find yourself behind. But I'm just giving you fair warning right now that you'll quickly lose 20% of your grade if you don't turn in the discussion boards on time. What does that mean? It means that we have the main post completed by Wednesday at midnight and we have two responses, at least two responses, by Saturday at midnight of the week that the discussion board is due, okay? So those are the deadlines each week for the discussion board. And perhaps more importantly than other classes, don't find yourself behind on these because discussion boards, and you can, you can understand this, if we're just inputting discussion board comments at the very end of each week or just at the very end of the class, none of us are benefiting the way that the discussion board was meant to be right? The way the discussion board is meant to be is for us to have interaction, for us to give an opportunity to our, our peers to read what we write. And if we're writing at the very end of the course, they're never going to see our opinions and perspectives. So it's very important, maybe more so than assignments and assessments in other classes, that the discussion board is, is something that we can interact and can, can learn from each other during that week. Um, John, are you asking to say something on the recording? Because I'm happy to, to let you speak on the recording if that's what you're asking, or are you asking something else for the discussion board? Yes. <laughs> 
thank you for the quick response. I was gonna I was gonna unmute you and and have you discuss with me, but I understand what you're saying now. Yeah, it it is a conversation, and one of the things that that people probably read, you know, that I that I put down as one of the announcements this week about the discussion board, and probably thought, oh, geez, this is gonna be a hard. He's he's gonna be a hard nosed professor and gonna be a tough guy. I that's not what I intended, but I do expect the discussion board comments to be your opinion. I expect that they won't be a cut and paste job from something you find online. I expect that primarily it'll be your opinions and feedback from things maybe that you did research online, but put in your own words. And and the whole point of the discussion board is for us to have a conversation, but also for you to formulate an opinion. Okay, so one of the things we have to do is instead of just regurgitating the research that we find online and, and showing our peers how much, you know, research we've done and how many, how, how we spent a couple minutes Googling, you know, the topic and cut and paste onto the board, that, that, that is not a discussion board for this class. A discussion board for this class is you doing some research, researching the articles that are assigned, researching other articles, other material is, is very welcome, of course. But then make sure that you give feedback that represents your opinions, your feedback, your unique perspective, not just somebody else's. It's exactly right. And thanks, Jonah, for kind of rewording what I'm saying, which is we want you to let us know how you feel or what you think about whatever topic it is that we're writing about. Okay. So just as an example, a little bit more specific for this week, Jonah, as you, as you think about your chart, right, your pie chart that you're going to be creating, we're going to be looking at it here in just a second. But as you think about that and as you work through that, instead of on your 100-word, you know, main post saying something like, I put down 40% email, 10% phone calls, and 50% um, handwritten notes, you know, uh, facts or handwritten notes, Instead of just telling us what you did, say, pl explain why you you did or came up with the numbers that you did, and explain why that's important. Explain why that might have changed, you know, over the past few years, or how that's different from a last job that you might have had. There's lots of ways and perspectives that you could take, and opinions that you could you could share about even something as as straightforward as a chart on ways we communicate. Okay. So expectations are that you'll read instructions carefully, that you'll turn things in on time. If you do that, okay, it'll be very simple. Okay, I didn't say the work would be simple, but it will be easy and straightforward uh, to get an A in this class. Okay, you know, just just read instructions, follow instructions, turn things in on time, and you'll be in great shape. There will not be anything in this class that that m tests your ability to be good at math or test your ability to speak in front of people, you know, which is some, you know, college level communication courses are all about speaking in front of others. There won't be any of that in this particular class. Um, so you don't need to stress about those things, but just following instructions and, and, and turning things in on time will get you the grade that you want from the class. Yeah, that's a great example, John. So, so most of us at work, you know, our, our modes of communication have probably changed over the past 20 or 30 years, right? And some people haven't been working that long, so it's not nearly as, as uh, helpful of an exercise. But some of us have been working a very long time, and we can remember, you know, long before, for example, instant message at work or email at work. Uh, and that has now become, you know, and texting at work, that, that's become such, those three modes have become so important now, and they were non-existent, you know, just a short time ago. So I think it is an interesting idea. And Jonah, yes, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear kind of your perspective on how your modes of, trans of, of communication have changed over the years. All right, so as far as grades are concerned, I just mentioned turn things in on time, follow instructions, you'll, you'll get an A from the class. Miss things, turn things in late, you'll still probably be able to pass as long as you turn everything in. The issue when it comes to not passing a class like this just has to do with not completing your work, okay? And there's just no excuse for that. I can't help you pass a class if you don't turn in your work. You have to turn in your work in order to probably pass a class like this. If you miss 
more than a week and everything else isn't in great order, you probably won't pass the class. And, and you know, if you're going to put any effort into one of these classes and any expense or cost or money into a class like this, there's just no excuse for that because this is not a hard class, right? We're not going to be doing something that's too complicated in, for you to, to understand or to, to learn. We're going to make it very straightforward, very streamlined, very simple. Um, but you still got to effort it, right? Put in, put in effort. And if you'll do that, I think you'll be happy with the results, you know, pretty straightforward results, get a good grade from the class like this and move on to the next one. Right. All right. So we have a learning coach for this class. I've already posted her information. I think her name is Natalie. She has some times that she allows people to, uh, you know, come into a group meeting and ask questions and learn. Uh, so, and she also allows you to email, her directly to set up a time if you feel like you're uh, something about this class is too complicated or, or frustrating you. Okay. So just something to keep in mind that she's also a very good resource uh, and help in this class. Now, having said that, I don't want anybody to think that I'm not willing to help. I'm absolutely willing to help, but sometimes you'll hear me explain something and you don't understand how I explained it. Right. And so sometimes it's great to have Natalie as, as kind of a backup to explain it a different way, and maybe that'll help you to uh, understand it better the second time. But if it's just something you need clarification on, please email me, call me, text me, whatever's easy, and uh, let me clarify and let me help in any way I can. I'm, I'm, I'm available. Um, but that brings me to my next point, which is communication methods in this class. Uh, we're, this is a class on communications. Just know that I, I do have a day job. Uh, I work as a financial planner over at Zions Bank in Utah, which means that during the day I'm not able to respond very quickly to email, phone, or text messages. However, if you leave me a message on any of those uh, methods, um, I'll get back to you within a day, okay? And the easiest one and most convenient one for me, as it says in the syllabi, is when you just email me, because then I don't uh, worry about maybe misplacing a text or phone call when I when I'm at work right email is easy for me to go through and keep organized all right okay so any of this stuff new to you Jonna any questions concerns problems so far any anything we should add some detail on some clarification okay pretty straightforward right pretty easy Shouldn't be any anything too hard that we've that we've reviewed so far. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of the subject matter. Okay. So we're talking in this class about communication. We're talking about ways, uh, methods of communication, and specifically how it applies to the business world. Right. And and sometimes when people say that. Uh, there are those of us who say, well, I'm not, I'm not a business person. I'm not in the business world. I just work at Walmart or I just work at McDonald's or I just work as a self-employed, you know, person who does um, landscaping, you know, and, and then they kind of tune out. But when we talk about business and we talk about communication specifically in the business world, that should apply to each and every single one of us, right? None of us should be left out of that. Everybody, everybody should uh, feel like they're part of the business world, no matter where you work or who you are, or what your status is, any kind of job that we have, we're going to be required to communicate in some way. Now, our modes of communication may be very different one job to another, but we're all required to communicate. And in large part, how successful we are at our job, how happy those who work with us and those who we work for are about our role at that job can be a function of how well we communicate. Whether or not that's email, phone call, text, whatever it is, our communication can really enhance or detract from our position and from our career. And so communication is just absolutely important. Now there are a couple different things from, these are all quotes each one from a different article that's required this week for your reading. These are online articles. I've checked all the links. They work just fine. But I've just grabbed one quote from each of those articles that I thought was interesting or a good synopsis of what those articles were trying to say. And they also speak to what we just were talking about, and that is how important communication is and good, effective communication is within the workplace. 
So one of the articles that we'll be reading this week says it is simply impossible to become a great leader without be being a great communicator. And once again, Jonna, some people will say, well, I'm, I'm not interested in being a leader, right? I, I don't need to be a leader. I just want a good job where I can work, you know, and, and make a good living. And I don't, I don't have to be a leader. But once again, leadership uh, in, in almost every work situation, I can find application to leadership. And especially as we look for promotion, as we look for maybe a better opportunity, a better job, um, leadership can become more and more important, right? Usually as we work our way up and usually as we, we start to earn more, many of those opportunities have to do with leadership and management, right? And, and so this article talks about how, hey, there's just nothing, perhaps nothing more important when it comes to great leadership than communication, okay? And one of the things, before we worry, you know, we have to be a good speaker, the article talks pretty extensively about how it's more than just being good at talking, right? There's a lot more to that. So anyway, it's an interesting article. It talks a lot about other success principles of leaders and of people who communicate well. And if we've got some time, we're going to go through some of those specifically at the end tonight. But a great article, uh, just just a really fun article. It's None of these articles are really long. And so, you know, they're just quick reads. You could read them all in a night and uh, and get a really good idea of what these articles are trying to say. Yes, and Jonna, that's exactly what this author spends a lot of time talking about is how good leaders and good effective communicators are very, very good at reading their audience and being good at, at taking cues from an audience so that they can communicate effectively to that specific audience. Okay, so they'll actually cater how they communicate to different audiences based on who they're communicating with, which makes sense, right? Got to know our audience is what we talk about in uh, communica communication classes. We know our audience. That means who is our audience and how should we speak to them? Not, I'm just going to speak the same way to every, every single group that I speak to, no matter how big it is, no matter who it is. No, each, each, each audience deserves a different kind of, of, of message and, and a different way in communicating that message. So good. Have you already read the article? Because if you haven't, you're doing a great job at coming up with, you know, what these articles are, are talking about. Good. So you, you were able to at least look through them. The, the next quote I, I brought out of a different article, it says, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Okay. The single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that has taken place. This is just an, uh, uh, a quote that I found actually online. It's not from one of our articles. But, but John, anything that you can, I mean, what does that even mean? When, when you first look at that quote, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. When you first look at that, it may kind of, you know, take a little bit to, to figure out what they're saying there. Completely agree with you, John, about your comment about knowing your audience and helping you be less nervous, right? If you're prepared to speak and you know who you're speaking to and understand what, what all about your audience and what you're going to say and you're well prepared, that can, that can lower the nerves, right? Because most of us, even folks who have a lot of experience communicating, the nerves start to build up when you're about to communicate. And so if you're, if you're prepared and if you know your audience, I agree, they'll, they'll, it'll go a lot better. Great. So, Jonna, your, your comment is, is, I think, a great one. So, you, you're basically saying, if I understand correctly, that if there can be times when we think we've communicated something, but really no understanding has happened, right? And so, if, if there's no understanding that happened, then the communication didn't happen either, right? Yes, words were said, or yes, a message was shared, but if the intent of that message or those words wasn't ever understood, then did it really happen, right? And, I, <laughs> and I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly what I thought when I saw this. It's amazing how many times in a marriage, right, or in any kind of relationship, friendship, you'll say, well, I told you that, right? We already talked about that. 
and whoever we're communicating to will say something like, no, we didn't. And you know you had that conversation, but it obviously wasn't understood, right? And if it wasn't understood, then, you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter that that, the, that communication even happened. And maybe another thing that applies more to families, right? And the dynamic between spouses especially is many times we think that we're communicating a lot more than we are um, when in reality we're not, you know, very verbal about our feelings, our thoughts, what we're trying to accomplish. And so sometimes, you know, between couples you'll play these games where, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever played these with other couples, but but where you'll where you'll ask questions and see how close to the right answer both cu- both partners will be about each other. And sometimes couples will find out, even if they've lived together for a long time, that they don't really know each other that well, right? Because they don't communicate as much. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's what I hope for, uh, Jonna, but obviously we know that that's <laughs> that's not the case, right? The, the interesting thing about that is that it happens at the workplace. It happens with friends. It happens, you know, a lot of times beyond, you know, our, our closest relationships, like our, like our partners or, or our spouses. Um, it even happens at the workplace, right? When we just make the assumption that something was communicated when it really wasn't that clear and when there wasn't really understanding between people. All right, another quote. A good understanding of the different types of communication and communication styles can help you deal with people better, clear up misunderstandings and misconceptions, and contribute to the success of the enterprise. Kind of a long quote, but pretty straightforward, right? If we can have good understanding and good communication, okay, then we can be more effective and productive at work. If we don't have effective communication, it's very difficult to be productive uh, and very difficult to, to make progress with our with our colleagues, with our peers, with people who we, we love the most, you know, relationships like we've talked about at home. That's, uh, you know, repeating, John, is a, is a skill. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of these things where, you know, I used to go to leadership courses back in the day and they would, you know, they'd have us role play and practice reiterating what somebody said back to them, right, to make sure that we understand. And at first, it felt like we were kind of being patronizing, you know, we're, we're kind of being belittling a little bit by saying, you know, if I heard you correctly, this is what you said. And it was a little bit too canned. But as you practice it, you can, you can do it in a way that doesn't seem as patronizing and, and in a way that, that just helps people feel validated, right? And people feel understood. And that's so important, especially, well, in all relationships that we have, business, otherwise, casual um, you know, our spouse, whoever it is, you know, if we can make them or help them to feel validated and understood, that goes a long ways for the relationship. But it happens that way at work, too. Uh, if we can help others feel validated and lifted and understood, it's amazing how, how well that can help our status at that workplace. One of the things that I was just in a work meeting this morning talking to employees at the bank about was how customers need to feel that, right? we need to help them in their concerns feel validated and understood. Sometimes just feeling understood is all the person really needs to, to, to not be so upset anymore. Right. That can be the first step to just a lot of healing, you know, and they they can be penned up and upset and frustrated. And if they just get the opportunity to talk and to really feel like somebody understands what their concerns and problems are, all of a sudden, you know, a lot of times you'll find that there isn't much of a problem, actually. Uh, They just needed the opportunity to to do that. Yep. Easier said than done, right, Jonna? So most of us are pretty good at, uh, at, at helping somebody else understand what we think and what we think is right and what we know. Uh, Very few of us, I think, are as good at helping someone else understand that we, that we, and validate somebody else, right? We're, we're usually, uh, well, I shouldn't say we're, you. I'll speak for myself. I have a, uh, it's a lot easier for me to feel like I'm trying to help somebody else understand me than it is the other way around, where I'm trying to help somebody else un, uh, understand that I understand them and validate them. So it takes practice, uh, it takes thinking about it. You know, we can kind of get lazy in our listening and lazy in how we communicate with people. 
if we're really trying to effort it, then maybe we can really come to, to have better communication, but also to understand people better and make people feel uh, more validated, which, which, like I say, is just such an important thing uh, for people to feel. All right. Another article, a very interesting article on this week's reading, has to do with defensive individuals. And, you know, it's just like what it sounds, you know, the, the, somebody who comes across as defensive in their communication style. And what the article talks about is, is how toxic that is. And, and we all can find ourselves being defensive, right? As we can be defensive communicators. Some, some people are just more often that way and other people find themselves kind of slipping into that sometimes. And then other people are really never defensive, you know, at, at, in communication. And let me give you an example. When you talk to someone, okay, and you're having a conversation with somebody, maybe it's a friend or family member, and they're always, it, it feels like a competition when you communicate with them. They're always trying to either one-up you or, you know, if you've got a problem, they've got a problem that's worse and they've got to share that with you. Or if you've got a victory, they've got a bigger victory or something that they try to take away from your victory about. Not necessarily that they're, and these people sometimes are not doing this on purpose, okay? Sometimes it's just an insecurity issue. Um, they're not very secure, and so they 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 try to, you know, validate themselves basically all the time instead of giving other people credit and instead of being gracious about what, you know, you have to share. But it kind of sucks the air out of a conversation or the air out of a room. And, and all of us can identify that with other people. Sometimes it's very difficult to identify it when we do it ourselves, right? And so sometimes it's good to have somebody – Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a friend that can just be honest with you sometimes and say, look, you know, that, that was kind of, that, that was kind of awkward when, when somebody said that they had this issue and then you, you just kind of shared your issue, you know, and, and didn't really validate what they were saying. So something we can all practice and be better at, something the more we read about and are aware of, then we can become what we refer to as more self-aware, which is where we really can see ourselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a more objective light and be more careful about how we react to people in a conversation and how we communicate uh, and, and try to limit kind of that defensiveness that can start to take over for some of us. And, and sometimes, like I say, it's, it's not, you know, it's not something we're trying to do. You know, we, we, we're, we don't want to be a bad conversationalist or a bad communicator, right? And be really negative or defensive. But for some of us, we fall into that because we're either, um, like I say, we're, we're a little bit worried or anxious. You know, sometimes anxiety can create that or insecurity can create that. And so whatever we need to do to practice our way out of that, um, we need to work at. Because this article does a very good job just basically saying, look, it, it really hurts productivity. It, it hurts teamwork. It hurts camaraderie. It hurts uh, other people's feelings can just get hurt, you know, by that. It makes it kind of a negative work environment. And uh, and all of us, you know, have that friend that we like them, right, as people, but sometimes it, it, it just feels like it's always a competition, you know, in, in conversation. And, and it's just kind of hard to talk to them, you know, and, and, and feel positive when you leave the conversation. And it's not that they're just always depressed or negative. It, it just is, it, there's kind of an adversarial or uh, divisiveness about how they talk with us, you know, and discuss with people. And so, uh, we, like I say, easy to see in somebody else, but more difficult to, to try to remedy and try to overcome in ourselves and try to get to a higher plane of conversation and communication with people so that people never feel that way about how we talk to them, right? And it might not get to a point where they never feel that way, but it might get to a point where we can limit how often, you know, we find ourselves in that. I, I completely, Johnny, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, sometimes we're the ones bringing on that from other people, right? <laughs> which, which is kind of a hard, you know, thing to, to stomach and, and to, to be aware of once again, to be self-aware of about, because it, it requires us to kind of lay our ego and our, you know, our, our, yeah, just lay our pride and ego aside for a minute and say, hey, you know, maybe it's how I'm approaching this conversation 
that may be creating the defensiveness that's occurring. I've got a, a an example of this actually. I, I I think this happens between managers and employees more often than it should, right? Managers sometimes come across overbearing. Uh, they come across like micromanagers. They come across like they're authoritarian, meaning they, they get to make all the rules and they don't want input from anybody. And when a manager does that and does it poorly, right, does it in a bad way, it tends to create that defensive communication from all of the people that they communicate with, right? And then you get into a situation where there's no effective communication happening. All the employees are always defensive and your team is never going to be successful if the employees just fear, you know, the manager and can't have open communication and effective communication with each other. I'm just trying to read your, your notes here real quick. Yeah, and I, I, I can, I can, you know, I, I see that in the workplace, you know, as an employee and also, you know, with employees, but you're absolutely right. It happens with us, with spouses and with our kids all the time. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, that people always try to, to tell parents, right, in parenting classes is to remain calm, right? It helps everybody in the situation to remain calm. Much easier said than done, though, again, right? <laughs> Much easier said than done, especially if, you know, we're in a situation where things kind of escalate very quickly, um, you know, and reactions and things like that. We're both quick to react. It's very difficult to, to stop that escalation and, and to keep uh, cool heads, you know, in a situation like that. So the, the point of this is in business, in our careers, we are going to have similar circumstances to what we have raising our children or with our spouses, where we need to communicate effectively. We need to be clear with expectations. We need to make sure there's understanding. We need to make sure there's validation and we need to make sure that our conversations don't incite defensiveness, but also that our own communication is not defensive itself, right? That we're very careful and self-aware about how our communication comes across. So once again, all very important things, much harder to do than it is to talk about. Um, uh, these are all things that are very complicated sometimes and, and take, take some serious effort if, if we want to improve at them. What's the benefit of improving at them though? If we can improve at these different things, these different kind of bullet points we've just talked about as keys to, to communication, boy, we, you know, business, our workplace environment, our home life, you know, just so many things can can really improve. Most family counselors and psychologists become coaches on communication, right? And the same can be can be said for business consultants as well. They become consultants on how to effectively communicate uh, between people in a workplace. All right, so let's move on a little bit. We need to talk about this week uh, and and get a little bit specific in what is what what we're supposed to do. So this week, you've probably already read the instructions or at least looked over them, John, based on our conversation to this point. But uh, what it's requiring you to do is to use a template. Now, you can create your own if you'd like. You know, you don't have to use the template that's in there. Years ago when I taught this class, th there was no template. So we had to come up with our own chart ourselves, which is not hard to do, you know, within Excel. They've got, it's very easy to, to do this. But to everyone's excitement, I'm sure, there's just a link now to download the template. You input your data, and it automatically updates this chart for you. So it's a very simple process to accomplish. But we'll show you real quick what we're talking about. Some of you probably have already seen it and know exactly what we're talking about. But for those of you who haven't seen it yet, the, this is not the template, by the way. Okay, this is just a, a, a new Excel file that I opened, a new sheet that I opened. What I did is I, you can put anywhere you want on the sheet. So if I put numbers like 4, 6, 80, and 10, right? These are my four methods of communication. I'm just showing you this because I think it is helpful to know how to just put together a quick chart in Excel. And most of you probably already know how to do this. 
But if I just highlight that data, right, the, the four pieces of data that I put in, and then I push insert, and I go over here to chart, right, and I go over here to whichever one I want, a 3D or a donut, whatever I want. Say I want the donut, right? Then all it did just now is it put in my four pieces of data onto a chart for me. You can see the gray is my 80%, the yellow is my 10%, 8% is the orange and 4% is the blue just by looking at it, okay? And then I can also go in and I can edit the information, right? And change what's on there. I can put, you know, I can have it look different. I can have the percentages show up. I can change the colors. I can do all kinds of different things with this chart, okay? So I just wanted to show you real quick how you would do a chart like this if there wasn't a template already set up for you. However, as I mentioned, there is a template. <laughs> so before you stress out about having to create a chart, know that it is very easy for future reference and it's a great way to illustrate information, right? So if you have some data points that you're trying to share with your team of employees or with a colleague or with your boss, instead of writing down, you know, handwritten on paper, the four pieces of information or three pieces of information, it's, it would be much more, uh, it'd be a much more positive presentation and visually appealing and memorable by putting it in a chart of some kind or a graphic of some kind. Most of us, we can, if we hear it and then see something that, that, you know, perks our attention, we're, we're much more likely to remember, right? And so even keep that in mind for resumes, right? We want something that's both informational, but, but maybe even more importantly, visually appealing because we want something that sticks out a little bit versus the hundreds of other resumes that somebody might get. Okay. Communication within the workplace is the same way. If we have a little bit of, of pizzazz to it, a little bit of enhancement to our information, we can get a lot more effective communication accomplished. And great, great thought, Jonna, you know, making it more personalized, right? And personable. Uh, one of the articles that uh, that we'll probably talk about here in a second talks a lot about how the more impersonal you make the data, the harder it is for people to relate, to understand, and to remember, right? The more personable you are, the more personable your information is, the more likely that they'll relate, understand, and remember, right? And that's the point. We want them to relate, understand, and remember. And so, um, you know, something like a chart can help, something like visual aids of different kinds can help. We need uh, a, probably every tool at our disposal to make sure that we, you know, that we can get our point across. All right, wrong screen. There we go. All right, so Excel is uh, an example of a visual, right, visual form of communication, a nonverbal visual form of communication. One of the articles this week talks about three different communication types. It talks about the verbal parallel language form of communication, the visual and body language. And interestingly, there are other forms, obviously, but I thought the one that, uh, you know, most of us are familiar with visual types of communication, charts, graphs, uh, pictures, you know, uh, video, those kinds of things. Most of us are familiar with how important body language is, appearance, you know, that first impression, those are very important when it comes to communication. And then finally, and, and like I say, a little different than many articles about communication, it talked about this paralanguage. And it talks about not, it's, it's sometimes less about what you say and sometimes more about how you say it. And I thought this was genius, you know, and, and, and something that, that's really, really important to for all of us to understand, both in the workplace, but kind of how we were talking before, Jonna, about how we say things to each other, to our families, right? So if we're escalating, becoming aggressive, becoming confrontational, that's the way we're doing it, right? It's not, it's not what we're saying, because we could say the exact same thing. I could say, Jonna, I, I'm, I'm frustrated that you, um, you know, are always turning your assignments in late. Uh, you know, what can we do to help? Okay. So I, I kept a level tone. I communicated very clearly that I was frustrated about something, right? And asked what I could do to help, right? So, so you may have felt uncomfortable by that. 
Um, but if somebody needs correction, right, having a level tone and stating clearly, you know, what the issue is and then responding with some kind of, of reach, you know, like, like, how can I help? What can we do? How do you think that we can solve this? Um, those types of things tend to tend to help us not only feel validated about what we're, you know, what the concern is from a, a managerial standpoint or from a leadership standpoint, but also have that person feel validated that there is something they can do about it, right? They're not helpless. They can, we can figure something out together and we can accomplish something, you know, going forward that, that makes it so we don't have this situation come back up. A poor way of doing it would be something more confrontational, right? Where I just come and I say, Jonna, you're really screwing things up. You got to stop, right? Or I yell, right? Exactly. Or I, you know, just, just come across really angry and huffy and puffy, storm in, storm out type of thing, how sometimes managers will do. And it, and it doesn't, you know, it belittles people, it embarrasses people, it makes people feel uncomfortable and not want to be part of the team, right? And we're always trying to make people feel validated and part of the team. Doesn't mean that we accept things that aren't right, right? There's a, and, and I think if you think back, Jonna, to different teachers that you've had over the years, some of the best teachers expect a lot of us, are very clear about their expectations, but are unwavering in what they expect of us, right? They're, they're not easy, but they're very clear and they're very helpful. And some of them are, you know, just excellent, excellent teachers. But part of the reason they're excellent teachers is because they expect so much of us and because the class responds so well to be to, to being part of that, that, you know, that expectation. So the reason I say that is because the same thing can be true, you know, in a work environment where we set clear expectations. We're, we're very good at getting people to understand uh, those around us. And then instead of getting, you know, and, and, and instead of being more worried about what we say, being more worried about how we say it, right. And really thinking that through before we just fly off the, off the handle and, and get aggressive or, or yell, right? Just like you said, Jonah. So, so the paralanguage, the, the way that we say it, not what we say uh, and how important that is. All right. Yeah, and, and John, I completely agree. I, you know, I, I think some of, some of the teachers that I had that I look back to, they, they were looked at as borderline mean and hard by other students sometimes. You know, some people would say, oh, you have that teacher. She's so hard or she's so tough or she's so mean. And, and they say mean, but they don't really mean mean. They just mean that they're tough, right? And uh, because most of those folks are very encouraging, very encouraging. You know, they set clear expectations. Things are hard, but they are very uh, accommodating and also very encouraging, like you said. Good, good, good thought there. All right, so I was going to go through a couple different examples just from my own work life just in the last little while that I think are, are interesting ones. I think all of us could come up with different things. You know, you'll be in a staff meeting and you'll just have just really poor communication between staff members or between a manager and the staff where, where you know, there's, there's obviously, you know, a, a manager that's talking down to staff, you know, people on their staff. Or there's obviously a situation where the staff doesn't trust or respect the manager, right? I mean, it can be two ways, right? Usually it's a manager being overly authoritarian, right? And, and just bossy, right? And over and, and, and uh, too much of a micromanager. That happens very commonly. But also the flip side is a lot of times you have employees that just from day one just have no respect for somebody in authority and don't know how to work for somebody else, right? And take any kind of orders at all. And as an employee, and you know, call it fortunate or unfortunate, doesn't matter. As an employee, we we you know that's the point, right? We have to we have to be able to take, um, you know, tasks you know from somebody else and accomplish them. That's just that's what being an employee is. And so, uh, so it it cuts both ways, right? As an employee, we can be poor communicators, poor understanders, poor listeners. And, and we can be poor employees, right, independent of having a bad manager. But, but managers don't, uh, don't add or enhance a situation or try to even improve it when they're, you know, 
when they're in a, when they're bad communicators and when they're very defensive communicators and insecure about, you know, themselves. And so sometimes they come across just so bossy and so mean, right? And I don't, I hope you haven't had many of those experiences it is as, you know, I've had a lot of experiences where I've been able to see that in other, you know, in as a, what I do for the bank and what I've done the last 15 years is I'm usually a partner to bankers and to tellers and to staff people at a bank and every bank has a branch manager, right? Somebody who's managing that branch. And a lot of times I see management at branches or at banks, you know, come down on employees of any kind and, and just a way that's just belittling and, and toxic. Um, and then I see other managers that are just have high expectations, but are very encouraging, like you mentioned about a teacher. So that can happen in staff meetings. It can happen even within short emails, right? We can come across, once again, not how we say it, but uh, excuse me, not what we say, but how we say it. We can have communication problems based on picking the wrong mode of communication. Sometimes we email when we should have had a personal conversation. Sometimes we email something too short and it's too easy for them to misinterpret what we're trying to say, right? Because emails are kind of left out there to, to misinterpret. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have, Jonathan. I mean, he probably has, has told you some horror stories about just people who are, you know, just, you know, have the small person syndrome. Woman or man, you know, just have the small person syndrome where they, where they have to overcompensate for something. We don't know what, but they just come across so mean, you know, and, and not helpful at all uh, to a work environment. Um, we can have conference calls where we, where we just make mistakes on how we communicate and come across on a conference call. We can have trainings that come across, you know, the wrong way because we communicate things wrong. And we can, and we can have ineffective training just because we don't communicate things well, right? Going back to, are we understood? And can we remember if we, if we understand in the moment, but it's not memorable, then, then it didn't help us either. Right. Because yeah, we understood it in the moment, but then we, if we don't remember what we learned or have a way of implementing what we learned or a follow up to, to what we learned, that's poor communication again, because we're not able to actually execute on what was communicated. We understood, but we didn't implement. And then finally, you know, one of the things that's become very popular in the workplace are these one-on-one -on -one in-person reviews, these, these work, workplace reviews that managers will do with, with employees. And, and some of these are just, these, these can be a train wreck if they're not very delicately handled and communicated well and, and gone through with the right intentions. You know, somebody trying to help somebody else and give constructive criticism as opposed to just, you know, going through the motions and then making it an opportunity to put out everybody's dirty laundry and be really negative about, you know, the workplace and, and what's going on at the workplace. So, so that's in, in person reviews, I see more and more as a common practice, you know, the, the one on one, uh, you know, job reviews and, and goals, you know, that a lot of companies will do quarterly or annually. And these are a place that, you know, people can really work on their communication skills as well. Yeah. So, you know, we all, we all go to a different, you know, maybe we've heard people speak or maybe we've gone to a seminar or maybe we've seen something on TV that we just thought, wow, that was very interesting and, and good to know that, you know, or very motivating in that moment. But there's, there's being motivating in that moment and understood in that moment. And then there's, you know, actually applying it right and doing it. And so sometimes the follow up and the, you know, is, is just a key part of, uh, of the communication itself and the communication will break down if we don't, you know, have that follow up and that method for application. Right. Okay. So I think that's enough on that. So one of the things I just wanted to bring up is the article. One of the articles I think says something kind of profound and that is they talk about how do we as individuals become better oral communicators, so verbal communicators, speakers basically, and then how do we become better writers? Because some of you uh, that are listening to this, John, and maybe you're in this boat, are, are never going to be very comfortable speaking, right? And so you're going to rely on maybe a career that's more about your writing. And some of us are going to be more uh, confident about our speaking and less confident about our writing. So, you know, it can go both ways. Some people are very confident about both and some people are, are feel themselves very inadequate and not confident about either. Okay. 
the point is the article talks about how how do we take either one of these and improve it and you might remember Jonna that that basically he, he, the the author just says if you want to be a better communicator a better speaker somebody that can use words well and and speak effectively the best thing to do is to speak more okay so <laughs> i know this what what happens is we kind of get into a spiral if we lack confidence and we have anxiety about speaking with people, we speak less. And when we speak less, it gets harder and harder and harder and we have more anxiety and it's more frustrating and we feel less confident and then we do it less and less and less to the point where we become very limited in our communication skills and efficiency and effectiveness because we just we just don't practice we we don't want to communicate with people we don't want to socialize we don't want to have you know have to give a talk or a presentation or anything like that and and it's not to say that everybody likes that you know there's only there's very few people that enjoy getting up in front of people so that's not what this is about i'm just saying and i agree with this article in that if you want to communicate more effectively it's a, if that's a goal if you'd like to be a more effective communicator find opportunities to communicate more Okay, find opportunities to communicate more, find opportunities to communicate in different ways, not just talking with your spouse, for example, okay, and discussing the day, although that's, that's great practice, but maybe giving a short presentation in front of people about something, right, or maybe practicing doing that, which sounds crazy, but there are also groups in every area of the country, it's called, they're called the Toastmasters, okay, <laughs> I thought this was a very interesting name, but, but basically, the, the name comes from giving a toast, right? Giving a speech or a toast at an event where you have to speak in front of people, right? It's called Toastmasters because these people are trying to master the ability to get in front of people and to effectively communicate. And these Toastmasters have associations all over the country. They basically get together and practice. They talk about different ways to effectively communicate. Then they demonstrate and practice communicating in front of each other. And it's basically a group of folks who feel comfortable to be able to do this, right? And, and I'm sure it wasn't comfortable right up front for these folks to get together and do that. But over time, as you get to know them and trust them and know that they'll just give you constructive feedback instead of being critical or judgmental and everybody's trying to improve together, th this could be a really effective way to once again find opportunities to communicate and, and have opportunities to be in front of people. Because if you don't have those opportunities and then get thrown into that in a, in a work environment, it can be terrifying. Um, and unfortunately, some of these happen in, in interviews for a job now. So you'll go in for an interview. You've got an interview with Bill over at whatever company, and you show up. And he'll invite his team of four or five people to sit around a table, have you stand up and present them, present to them a quick presentation on a certain topic, any topic that they want. Basically, to test your ability to communicate effectively ideas and information because it's so important in the workplace. So, so just know that that can be part of the interview process. And I know I'm scaring some of you and some of you are going to say, well, I, don't, I don't even want to interview with anybody now that Shipley said that this is what might happen. But, but that's not the point. I, I, would, I just hope that you'll be prepared for that and take opportunities when you can to do quick improv. Yes, quick little ex extemporaneous speeches on different topics because it's very likely that you'll get put in that situation, you know, either in the interview process or once you're in that workplace. Um, let's see here. Yeah, improv, Jonna, exactly. So with that, um, I don't have more time to cover more of the information from the different articles that I wanted to, but I think they're very good. I especially like the 10 secrets of communication. I think that's a great article. It's a little bit longer. It's probably the longest one, but I think each one of those tips are worth considering and thinking about and, and just having as, as ammunition, you know, when it comes to communicating, uh, ammunition in that, and that you'll have that information to help guide and direct and kind of be the lens that you communicate through, right? Once you know that information and can, can remember that information, maybe review it a few times. So, so I think there's some great articles this week. We've just got the discussion board. That's it. So it should be a pretty straightforward week. But if you've got any questions or concerns, John, as you get into the coursework, let me know. I'll give you some feedback and, and try to help you out the best I can, as fast as I can. I sure appreciate 
you being here tonight. Thank you very much. And the, the, your peers are very grateful that you were here tonight as well, because, uh, you know, having somebody for me to interact with a little bit in the class is much more entertaining than when I'm just speaking to air. Okay. When I don't have anybody to ask questions of or to get any kind of feedback from. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, I hope we'll have a few more people join next week so you don't get picked on <laughs> again. Uh, but, but understanding that eight o'clock might be really late for some places and understanding that Monday, you know, it was really fast in a new class. So I hope a few more people will join us next week. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or concerns this week. That's all I've got for tonight. Any questions tonight before we wrap up, Jonathan, since you're here. Okay. Well, have a great night. Have a good week. Let me know if there's anything we can do. And we'll be back this same time next week, next Monday. And uh, have some more fun learning about communication. Thanks. Bye.